It's another edition of Time About the Movies, and today we're taking a look at the films of September 26, 1997. we got six movies to look at today, some notable films in this bunch to say the least. So let's go ahead and jump on into it. We'll start off with the biggest new release of the weekend, which is George Clooney and Nicole Kidman starring in The Peacemaker. Sources indicate this blast was 50 to 100 times more powerful than the one in Hiroshima, Japan. Initial projections indicate the nuclear fallout will affect... All it was an SS-18, 10 warheads. One detonated, eight with you. That leaves one unaccounted for. The guy got away with a bomb. On September 26th. We have a weapon of mass destruction coming into the United States. George Clooney. Now, you are not in Washington anymore. You are in the real world. Nicole Kidman. I'm not afraid of the man who wants 10 nuclear weapons, Colonel. I'm terrified of the man who only wants one. The Peacemaker, rated R. Of course, The Peacemaker is most notably known as the first official release from DreamWorks at SKG, which of course is Steven Spielberg, Jeffrey Katzenberg, and David Geffen's film company they put together when they was when uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg was fired by Disney and Steven Spielberg launched his own film company along with David Geffen, whose Geffen Pictures was still making some films, but not as much as they did back in the 80s and 90s. So they came together and they started putting out movies. And this was the first movie they put out with George Clooney and Nicole Kidman in it. It's a political thriller where you have Clooney as a U.S. Army colonel and Nicole Kidman as a civilian woman who's supervising him. They have to track down stolen Russian nuclear weapons before they're used by terrorists. And um, film did very well. It was the number one movie when it came out, which for a first-time studio... To have a film that come out at number one like this, that's a pretty good accomplishment. And you could probably say that most of the buzz was because it was Steven Spielberg, Jeffrey Katzenberg, and David Geffen's company making their first film. Especially Steven Spielberg's name alone. I mean, that probably sold the tickets more than George Clooney and Nicole Kidman. I mean, George Clooney was not a household name on in movies yet, just yet, even though he still was very much a household name on TV with ER. And Nicole Kidman's career was slowly but surely building. And, um... The movie overall is nothing that spectacular, honestly. Like, it, it's nothing we haven't seen done over and over again. I mean, this is a story that's been pretty formulaic, but I think Clooney and Kidman carried the load through. It, it makes for a somewhat enjoyable film for the most part, but it's not one that's really going to warrant a lot of rewatchability re overall. It's a film that it's fine for what it is, but... It's not probably the best way to start this company off, but then again, DreamWorks would eventually show their true potential in the years to come, especially the next year with um, Saving Private Ryan coming out and then the start of DreamWorks Animation and how that has transpired over the years. I mean, for a first film from the studio, it's not the best, but we know what follows afterwards, so in a way, it's fine for what it is. It's nothing too spectacular, it's nothing too incredible, it's nothing too amazing, but... The performances by Clooney and Kidman, I think, overall do carry the film over to making it somewhat okay for what it is. It's not a bad movie by any means necessary, but just not a great movie overall. So, uh, yeah, fine for what it is, but no classic by any means necessary. You can watch it once, and you'd probably be okay with it after what is. You probably never want to watch it again after that. But um, let's go ahead and move on to the next movie we have here, and that is Soul Food. You know, honestly, to kind of run down the plot for it, I feel like I have to show you the Boondocks clip. We're going to pause this for the benefit of all y'all who never saw Soul Food. 
Soul Food is a movie about a big, humongous black grandmother, aptly named Big Mama. Big Mama demonstrates her love by feeding herself and her offspring enormous amounts of kid lard. Then, get this, Big Mama's arteries are so clogged, they gotta amputate her arm. It was her leg! Right, okay, whatever, leg. Then, she dies of a heart attack. <laughs> or another stroke, or something. God called her home. And what does the family do after she dies? They get together for a Sunday dinner and eat the same food that just killed Big Mom. The same food! They didn't learn a lesson. Nobody went on a diet, and that's the end of the movie. I mean, he's not wrong. That's literally the plot of the movie, and that's literally what happens in it. And, um, it's, um... You know, honestly, I've seen it before. I've seen it because it's on the double feature DVD set for Waiting to Exhale that I have. But um, honestly, it's not the worst thing ever. But at the same time, the Boondocks kind of made the best honest st thing about things you could say about that movie, honestly. Because really, the whole message of the movie is that this woman, this gr this grandmother who cre who cooks all this food, ends up get ends up having a stroke, having her leg amputated, and going into a coma and dying. And then by the end of the movie, they're just eating the same food that they have, that killed her in this case here. Like, in a way, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Like, it it feels like it's just kind of setting these people up for the net, for them to follow in her footsteps. But with that said, though, it's not the it's not a bad movie per se. It's not even a really terrible movie. It's a pretty enjoyable movie, mostly because of the cast involved. You see Vanessa Williams in there, you see Vivica A. Fox, Neil Long, you see Michael Beach, Makai Pfeiffer, Irma P. Hall playing the grandmother. Um, there's a good cast involved in here. It's hard is in the right place, and it is a fairly entertaining movie, honestly. It is a film that, despite the obvious kind of flaws in terms of the story structure, it's fine for what it is. For an ensemble piece, I think it works fine for what it is, but it's definitely one of those movies that doesn't warrant a whole lot of rewatchability to it. I mean, Kind of like with The Peacemaker, I watched it one time and I was just kind of like, it's fine for what it is. And I think after I saw the Boondocks episode where they parodied that, I think I gained kind of a, kind of not that much of a, a respect for it afterwards because they pretty much summed up the, the problem with the movie overall. But like I said, it's not the worst thing ever. It's a decently made film. It has a good cast to work off. It's hard. It's in the right place. And it does show a, a good, honest depiction of a more positive image of African Americans than what was seen at the time period when you had all these gangster movies coming out. These gangster movies and these black films of like Boys in the Hood and Do the Right Thing coming out at the time. It was not. It is nice to see a more positive image like that every once in a while, and I think the movie did a pretty good job with it for the most part. Um, not a classic by any means necessary. It's not one I'd watch over and over again, but I thought it was fine for what it is. I don't have any ill will towards it whatsoever, but I think the boondocks did kind of give me a little bit more ill will than I should have, because that joke that, is that their way they, of summing up this movie was just pure perfection there, I mean, I got nothing else for you on that one, so that's Soul Food so let's go ahead and move on to the next movie we have here and that is Alec Baldwin and Anthony Hopkins in The Edge A photographer with an eye for beauty Okay, great. Let's do one more Nice looking lady a man of wealth who lives through boys. Cosmos everything. Get a question to ask. I seem to take all these facts and put them into any useful purpose in another matter. Of each the essence of the civilized man. Well, Charles, we're going on an impromptu adventure. You come too. Oh, all that money. Never know what people value you for. I think you want to be cute too. So, how are you planning to kill me? Hold on! Civilization disappears. Why do you even think they'll come looking for us? Our friend's a billionaire. You know what happens when you misplace one? Ah! All they have is each other to rely on. Most people lost their lives die of shame. If they didn't do the one thing which could save their lives. Thinking they're willing to survive. And the question. Like you gotta love how Anthony Hopkins knows that Alec Baldwin's got after him and he wants his he wants his wife. But he's just going along for the ride, and he's going to kill him first before he get, even gets a chance to kill him. Him, and you also kind of have to think when those when those birds are hitting the plane. For some reason, I think Alec Baldwin set that up. Like I don't know how he did it, but that just seemed too perfectly timed, at least in that trailer. But um, 
This is The Edge, and like I said, the plot follows Anthony Hopkins and Alec Baldwin, who are kind of in this rivalry for Alec, Anthony Hopkins' wife, so they have to, it's their plane crashes in the Alaskan wilderness, and along with their assistant, played by Harold Perrineau, uh, they have to trek through the elements to try to survive, all while being hunted by this Kodiak bear and the men's fraying friendships. The, the Kodiak bear in this, played by Bart the Bear, who is known for being in several of these movies, is the bloodthirsty Kodiak in this one, in one of his last film roles. So, it's a very, good, it's a very uneven film, but it's a David Mamet movie, and David Mamet usually writes a lot of really good, entertaining movies, and this is pretty fun for what it is. I like seeing Anthony Hopkins and Alec Baldwin going at each other's necks, and you wonder, and you do wonder how this is going to pan out in the end. Like, what's going to be the big resolution at the end of the movie? Are they actually going to kill each other, or are they going to establish somewhat of a, somewhat of a an alliance together, I should say. Um, for what it is, it does pr a pretty good job of keeping you on the edge of your seat. The action, se the sequences where they're trying to survive the elements are very well done. There's a lot of good action sequences all around here. The visual look of the film is really impressive, and for this director, Lee Tambahori, who would later go on to... Who'd, at, the last film he did was Mulholland Drive, and would later go on to do Along Came a Spider, and then the infamous Die Another Day... It's probably the the best film he's ever directed, honestly, judging by his filmography here. Um, yeah, for the most part, it's an entertaining movie, and you you get invested because a Alec Baldwin and Anthony Hopkins work off each other so well, and b the script by David Mamet, which is uneven at times, but at the same time, it does work very well for what it is. Be you know, I usually have nothing against David Mamet. I do like a lot of his movies, so maybe I kind of have a soft spot to it, honestly, but. Um, not an overall perfect film, but still one that's pretty enjoyable, too. Uh, that's The Edge. So let's go ahead and move on to the next movie we have here, and that is Donald Sutherland and Aidan Quinn in The Assignment. Terrorism is regrettably a growth industry. In the secret wars between nations, there are soldiers and heroes. There are martyrs and madmen. And there are the men in the shadows who lead them. Everyone, please! My name is Carlo. For 20 years, Carlos the Jackal led a reign of terror so brutal. His capture was an international obsession. Austria has won a positive ID. That's when your name came up. Henry Fields, CIA. You recognize the terrorists as Carlos. They're both very well known in this business. So this is a strange concept. Uh, this is based off of a story. Um, it's set mostly in the 1980s. deals with the CIA plan to use his, Anthony Quinn's character to masquerade as this Venezuelan terrorist called Carlos the Jackal. Even though you see Carlos played by Aidan Quinn in the beginning. Um, it's a very odd concept. I've never seen this movie, honestly, so I can't really say if it's any good or not. But you also you see Donald Sutherland in there, as well as Ben Kingsley is also in the film as well. And... Uh, it's interesting because it's kind of reminiscent to the Jackal, and I think this is somewhat of a remake of the Day of the Jackal, uh, because there was also another remake called the Jackal with Bruce Willis and Richard Gere would come out two year two months after this in '97. Um, I don't know if this is a straight up remake of the Day of the Jackal, even though I see on I don't see anything that says based on the Day of the Jackals for this particular film. I know the other Jackal is a straight up remake of that, but. It's an odd movie. It's an odd-looking film, honestly. And I don't know if it's any good or not, but... Judging by the fact that the Jackal, the Bruce Willis Richard Gere one that comes out after this, did not let, let, do very well. It was not a critical hit nor a financial hit. And I don't remember really liking that movie all that much. I gotta admit that... I gotta say that this one's probably gonna be better. I've never seen it, but judging by the fact that the other Jackal is not a good movie, this probably is a lot better than that. But that's not really saying a whole lot because I haven't seen the film. The director of this also later went on to do The Art of War, and then he also went on to do Extreme Ops and Hitler, The Rise of Evil. So, so he's not a good, he's not the best director overall, but at the same time, considering what else came out that year with the other Jackal movie, this is probably better than that one. i got to at least give it that, but like I said, I haven't seen the movie, so I don't really know for certain, but um, that came out that weekend. So let's go ahead and move on to the next movie we got here, and that is Ang Lee's The Ice Storm. Next stop will be New Canaan, Connecticut. New Canaan, Connecticut. Next stop. Once there was a time when families Hello? were strangers. 
Paul. Hey, Dad. Guy, well, I'm just confirming uh, you'll be on the 440 on Wednesday, right? So you and your sister can mope around the house, and your mother and I can wait on you hand and foot while the two of you occasionally grunt for more food. Neighbors or lovers? You know, I think Elena might suspect something. Is that a new attaché? Uh, yeah. Uh, Musk or something. And America was learning the truth. Are you watching this? Watching what? Nixon doofus. He's a liar. Calm down. I wasn't in on it. So the ice storm, as you can tell, takes place during Thanksgiving 1973. It's about two dysfunctional families in Connecticut, two upper-class families. Uh, they're trying to deal with the social changes of the early 70s and their escapism through alcohol, adultery, and sexual experimentation. You see Kevin Klein in there. You see Joan Allen, Christina Ricci, Tobey Maguire, Sigourney Weaver. Katie Holmes is also in here as well. Um, Elijah Wood, uh, Henry Cerny. Uh, just some notable names in there, and this is Ang Lee's follow-up, of course, to Sense and Sensibility, and it's a pretty good movie. I mean, it's this is still peak Ang Lee. This is before his somewhat sm somewhat small downfall with um, Hulk in 2003, and then before his big comeback after that. Um, this is right in the middle of his early peak as a filmmaker, and it is a really good film. It's a really good f film with a lot of good performances all around, a lot of good situations in terms of the story. You get invested in the characters and how this is going to transpire in the end. It's an overall really enjoyable movie. It's a film that really is certainly one of the stronger films to come from Lee at the, is early, overall. Like, of all of his films, this is one that I've seen more than once. And more than once, every couple is like, I want to say maybe, maybe four or five times in my life I've seen this movie. It's a pretty good movie. It's not one of his best. It's not one of the greatest films he's ever done. I think the greatest film that Ang Lee has ever done is probably Brokeback Mountain. At the same, is a mix. It's either it's a mix between Brokeback Mountain, Hidden Dragon, and Life of Pi. Those are the top three that I think of. And uh, this probably would be fourth on the list, honestly. It's that close. It's a really good movie. Kevin Klein gives another great performance, and you see Christina Ricci, Tobey Maguire, and Elijah Wood showing their potential that they would later show in other movies. A great cast overall in this film. Really terrific film. Can't recommend it enough. The Ice Storm. Really good film. So let's go ahead and move on to the last one we got here, and that is Trojan War. Well, I can tell you the first thing that this movie had wrong with it. PG-13 for a movie about a guy who's trying to buy Trojan condoms and have sex with this girl. Uh, PG-13 teen sex comedy. I don't think I need to explain why that's wrong right there. Um... This was a this was a disastrous movie that came out, and it was a fifteen million dollar movie. It wasn't a high budget film. I mean, the stars of this movie were pretty popular at the time. I mean, Will Friedle was still on Boy Meets World. Jennifer Love Hewitt was still on Party of Five. Marley Shelton was a rising actress. So this wasn't a this wasn't a high budget fi film that could have that could have lost more than it did. But even for a fifteen million dollar movie, you know how much money this movie made in total? Three hundred and nine dollars. Let's put it this way. My paycheck is more than $300. There's more money in my wallet that's, than what this movie made. Actually, not really, but but you get the idea here. I, like, It's amazing that this thing made as little money as it did. In fact, this was only released in one... But here's a couple reasons why. It was only released in one movie theater. It was pulled after one week. And then it made $309 against a production budget of $15 million. It is the lowest grossing film since modern record kept keeping began in the 1980s, which you also got to take into consideration that this isn't even the lowest grossing film ever. I mean, Zizek's Row with Katherine Heigl in 2006 still holds the record. It only made $30 total in its release. And um, actually, was Zizek's Row featured in more than one theater? I got to check this. I got to look at this now just to be sure here. Zizek Road. I know this is just dead air here, dead air here, but hold on. Okay, I found it. Zizek's Road, 
was shown once a day at noon. So, okay, that, that, that makes more sense because this was only shown once a day for a week. And it only made $30. Zizix Rose was in, a the, was in one theater all day and made only $300, million, $300 total. $300 million would have been a miracle. But, um, so yeah, Trojan War was not the big hit that they they wanted it to be. And I don't... And it's George, it's George Huang who directed this movie, who did the brilliant Swimming with Sharks, and this was his follow-up film. And you gotta wonder, what the hell happened? Like, why did this why did this not get the proper treatment? I mean, once again, it has to do with the fact that it's a PG-13 movie about teen sex and buying con condoms. I mean, that's pretty much self-explanatory there, but how do you go from Swimming with Sharks to this? I mean, this is... If the movie was any good, then probably there'd be a reason to really look at it more as something in an enjoyable film, but no, this movie really does not do that. It's a lazy, lazy comedy that's not funny. The sex in this movie is not engaging because it's PG-13. You don't get any satisfaction from watching this, and you don't like these characters, really. The, the jokes in this movie just aren't funny. The film overall isn't that entertaining. Um... I think Warner Brothers knew that this was going to be bad from the get-go, and that's why this didn't have a huge track record. Is Most people, is not just me, but most people probably have more money in their wallets right now than this movie made in, this, is in its entire run. Just think about that for a second. That's pretty pathetic for this movie, and um, you can see why it didn't do very well here, so... Um, I think we're done with this one here. The, honestly, this honestly, there's no real way to define this movie except it's one of the biggest bombs ever. I mean, it's one of the biggest flops ever, and it doesn't even it wasn't even that good of a movie to begin with. So maybe WB was onto something here. You should have just shipped it off to video. I mean, if Theodore Rex can go straight to video, then why the hell didn't this go straight to video either? So anyway, so that's Trojan War for you. So with that said, that wraps up another edition of Time About the Movies. When we hit, return next week, we got seven more movies to look at, including Morgan Freeman starring as Alex Cross in, in uh, Kiss the Girls, Oliver Stone's latest film, U-Turn. We also have The Matchmaker. We have Fast, Cheap, and Out of Control, The Locust, Washington Square, and Forgotten Silver. So seven movies to look at overall, and we'll delve into those on the next episode. Uh, but until then, thank you so much for watching, and if you want to see more videos like this, uh, please hit the place on the next page, check out the previous episode, and also don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you want to see more videos like this. And uh, uh, with that said, I will see you guys next time for another video. So thank you for watching, I will see you next time, and until then, as always, take care.